Today, we have a great honor from four distinguished speakers who will share their knowledge under the theme of Biocircular Green Economy, Turning Challenges into Opportunities in the Post-COVID-19 World. And the first keynote speaker is Professor Chen Jianlun. Professor Chen is a renowned epidemiologist and former vice president of Taiwan. Professor Chen received international attention for his role in leading Taiwan's response to the COVID-19 pandemic due to his unique position as both vice president and his epidemiological background. He is now an academician and distinguished research fellow and genomic at, of the Genomic Research Center at the Academy of Seneca. And today he will give a talk on global health and universal vaccination. Please welcome Professor Shen. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind introduction. And please, dear President and Vice President of NESTA, uh, distinguished invited speakers and all participa participants, and good afternoon and good morning. And it is really my pleasure and honor to be invited to give a presentation in this uh, NASDAQ's uh, 30th anniversary uh, President's uh, Forum. And I, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, NASDAQ uh, for, and say happy birthday uh, to you. And you indeed have very significant uh, impact on this uh, science and technology development in the last 30 years. So I would like to congratulate and also uh, say happy birthday first. And today I'm going to uh, present on the global health and universal uh, vaccination. As we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a severe uh, mortality and mobility uh, in the whole world and also caused uh, the recession of eco economies in almost all the countries in the whole world. Um, by uh, March 24th, uh, and as you can see on these slides, there's an, um, more over 124 million confirmed cases and over 2.7 million deaths of COVID-19 and resulted in a case mortality rate of 2.2%. And we know that Thailand has been uh, coped with the COVID-19 quite well. Thailand has a population of 69 million, and you have uh, 23,000 confirmed cases with 92 deaths, and with the case mortality rate only 0.3%. That's really wonderful. And uh, for the Taiwan, we have population of 23 million, and we have uh, 1,000 uh, confirmed cases and 10 deaths, our case mortality rate is 1%. And as you can see on these slides, there's a uh, COVID-19 uh, affected all the SDGs in the world. Just as mentioned by the president of NESTA, that uh, COVID-19 uh, sustainability is very important. And last year, COVID-19 affects all SDGs, including the uh, cost of poverty, cost of hunger, and damage to the good health and well-being also affect the quality of education and even the gender equality education. All of these are affected by this COVID-19. So I think that COVID-19 is very uh, serious uh, to, for, to affect this and all SDGs in the world last year. And according to this assessment of COVID-19 control in 75 emerging and frontier economies uh, by the uh, Bloomberg economies last uh, July 20th. They access this uh, COVID-19 control in 75 uh, economies according to three criteria. The first one is mortality from COVID-19. The second one is economic activities. And third one is policy space available to counter the damage. And they identify uh, five best economy. Uh, Taiwan was ranked as number one, followed by Botswana, South Korea, and Thailand, and China. So I would like to congratulate Thailand for very uh, excellent achievement in the containment of COVID-19. And according to this Newsweek Japan uh, 
assessment of our response to COVID-19 in 49 countries uh, that's published in July 21st last year. And according to two uh, assessment criteria, epidemic damage, and this including the cumulative confirmed cases, and also the confirmed case increasing rate, as well as case fatality rate. And the second criteria is this uh, economic damage, that's the GDP loss. And in the Newsweek Japan's um, assessment, and as you can see that the top 10 best countries included Taiwan, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Thailand, China, South Korea, and so forth. So uh, both uh, Thailand and Taiwan are doing uh, relatively good compared to other countries. And this is a report from the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research by the United States uh, in last October. And you can see that here, at uh, this uh, axis, the horizontal axis is the COVID days per million people, and the uh, vertical uh, axis is the GDP loss. And you can see uh, clearly uh, the, the poor, the COVID-19 control, the higher the GDP loss. And Taiwan, uh, on this um, uh, uh, left bottom side of uh, this uh, slide, and you can see that Taiwan has this uh, low, one of the lowest uh, deaths from this uh, rate from COVID-19, and we have a positive uh, economic uh, growth, the GDP growth uh, last year. So I, I would say that the better the COVID-19 containment, the better the economic uh, development last year among uh, countries in the world. And I would like to share with you the global failure in pandemic containment policy. I think that uh, now there are nine uh, failures. The first one is the inadequate contact tracing and tracking resulted in the outbreak and city lockdown in Wuhan last December. And the second failure is the postponed announcement of public health emergency of international concern, PHEIC, from World Health Organization in January. And also, if these two uh, failures cost there's a delayed border control of passengers from the epidemic areas in February and the insufficient track and trace system to identify cross contact result in an outbreak in many, many countries. And a lot of countries uh, practice a city lockdown, but without the promotion of personal hygiene, social distancing, and avoidance of large scale gathering. And this uh, caused this uh, the increased in this instance of COVID-19. And many countries practice uh, mass screening, but without enforcement of 14-day isolation and quarantine of this infected people. And the seventh failure is the shortage and panic buying or hoarding of the uh, pu uh, protection uh, equipment. And the eighth one is the limited response to this information dissemination, and this caused the anxiety and panic of the public. And the last nice one is lack of the professionalism and political neutrality in some countries. So I think that, uh, for instance, uh, according to the paper published in New England Journal of Medicine, and you can see that uh, in, 19, in 2019, uh, this, um, in December of 2019, there's already a huge number of uh, so a typical pneumonia cases, severe cases in Wuhan, but they did not do that's a very good cross contact tracing and did not do home quarantine. So uh, the diseases were spread out by this uh, asymptomatic or mild disease patient. And this re resulted in the city lockdown of the Wuhan. And as you may see in Taiwan, that's an uh, we did a very good reform of the epidemic prevention system in Taiwan after the SARS outbreak in year 2003. In year 2003, we were affected by SARS severely, very severely. So after the uh, SARS outbreak, we try our best to amend our Communicable Disease Control Act and relevant regulation and we recruited, uh, restructured our Ministry of Health and Taiwan CDC and we also give this authority to this uh, Taiwan CDC to designate 
healthcare institutions to function as responding or isolation hospitals. And we enhanced hospital infection control through the hospital accreditation. And we also standardized our procedures for a communicable disease surveillance and reporting domestically and internationally. We optimized our border quarantine procedures and we recruit and train infectious disease specialists in our Taiwan CDC. And the last but not the least, is we established our National Health Command Center, NHCC. So when Taiwan came across the COVID-19 attack uh, on the January 22nd, and our president, Dr. Chai Ing-wen, he called us on a National Security Council meeting immediately. And he urged us uh, to uh, fight against the COVID-19 based on our knowledge and experiences uh, learned from the SARS outbreak in year 2003. And the, the most important element for the successful containment of COVID-19 in Taiwan includes a prudent action, rapid response, early deployment, transparency, public trust, and solidarity. And as you can see here in Taiwan, uh, we have a uh, very rapid response to pandemic. There's uh, no safety lockdown in Taiwan, no mass screening, but we use a lot of uh, smart technology to do uh, this uh, pandemic prevention. The first one is the prudent surveillance of pandemic status uh, using this ICT and AI. So we learn there's an outbreak of atypical pneumonia cases in Wuhan as early as on this uh, December 31st, 2019. So we take action uh, to respond to this kind of outbreak in Wuhan immediately. And we uh, implemented our own board quarantine system for all the in Wuhan passengers uh, directed from, from Wuhan to Taiwan. So we have very prudent uh, surveillance and we also quick announced, quickly announced the traveling warning using our cellular broadcast. And we uh, emphasize the importance of the stringent border control and we use e-quarantine system to help us to uh, monitor this home quarantine and home isolation. We also carry out in-depth tracing of cross content of confirmed cases and using ICT and big data analysis. And we enforced home isolation or home quarantine for cross contact and inbound passengers using digital fencing tracking and line bot system. And we carry out a precision screening of suspects with symptoms and signs. We also mobilized healthcare system for isolation treatment. We mobilized 20,000 isolation room and 14,000 ventilators. Fortunately, we did not use that uh, uh, too much, too many. And we also enhanced the hospital infection control using the disinfection or delivery robots. Um, for instance, for the home quarantine, home isolation and electronic security monitoring system, as you can see on this slide, for all the inbound passengers, uh, from uh, endemic area, pan pandemic area, and we carry out that uh, home quarantine. And all these uh, travelers, inbound travelers, has to stay uh, at this uh, quarantine place for 14 days. And the close contact with the confirmed cases uh, on the right hand side, they have to be home isolated or isolated in a quarantine place. And we use electronic security monitoring system to track and locate the location and health status of people subject to home quarantine and home isolation. So I just mentioned that we use the big data system, technology and artificial intelligence and also the ICT. Anyone who get into the Taiwan has to uh, fill out this on uh, a quarantine uh, form and that's, uh, we have a quarantine system for entry and uh, they get this uh, home quarantine checking system. And we have uh, on the right hand side, the digital fencing checking system. So we, we're using this kind of uh, digital devices and everybody has to have a mobile phone at, at hand and say we can follow up there and twice a day. So we use this way, I uh, try to do very good quarantine. And of course, it is very difficult to ask the people, uh, a person uh, to stay at home or quarantine place for 14 days. So we provide 
care and support services for isolated and quarantined persons, including this and uh, a local government hotline. If they need any kind of help, they can call the hotline. And we have a uh, meal delivery, garbage collection. We can even uh, arrange the settlement uh, for the quarantined or isolated people. If they need a personal help, and we have someone to do this on a family visit. If they come down with some suspected symptom, we send them uh, to the hospital using the dis designated ambulance. If they have a chronic diseases, we can also arrange uh, medical care. So in this way, we try to help the people who were quarantined and isolated. And as you can see on the right hand side, if the person is on, uh, on quarantine, and uh, then we also give them there's an epidemic compensation. We give them $1,000 uh, per day uh, for 14 days. So using this way, we try to urge all this close contact and inbound passenger uh, to be quarantined uh, very well at home. And by January uh, 17 this year, uh, in total, we have more than 12,000 people have been uh, isolated at home and more than 490 thousand uh, people have been home quarantined. So in totally, we have around a half million people have been home isolated and quarantined. But you can see at the bottom of this table, that's, on the, that's around only 1,500 people have been penalized in other words. They did not follow uh, the uh, government guideline and restriction. In other words, um, more than 99% of quarantined and isolated people they are following government guidelines well, well. They stay at home for 14 days and also followed by seven days of uh, self-health uh, management. So I always say that in Taiwan, we have good containment of the COVID-19 because we have 23 million unsigned heroes in Taiwan. All the people in Taiwan comply to government regulation very well. And during this period of time, uh, our Taiwan AI lab developed different kinds of platform for uh, social distancing, for health report, and also have a, a SARS-CoV-2 classifier to help the uh, physicians to uh, do this uh, chest X-ray examination. And we also do this uh, tracing of virus strains and have a drug repurposing to develop the new antivirals. And we also help the uh, researchers uh, to do this literature review. So we use different kinds of platform uh, developed by Taiwan AI Lab uh, to do this uh, COVID-19 uh, containment. And at the beginning of this uh, COVID-19, we run out of this uh, face mask. But welding face mask is very important. That's the reason why we have a requisition of 73 factory to expand the 92 production line. So our average production of face masks uh, increased from 1.1 million in January to 21 million in May. So in this way, uh, we can have an uh, adequate supply of face masks. And we ask everyone to wear face masks. And we also use name-based distribution system uh, to help us to do this uh, distribution of this uh, face mask. Everyone, if, although they are poor, and everyone in Taiwan, they can get a very low price and face mask. And we urge everyone to put on the face mask. When we have adequate face mask, and we donate a more than a 54 million mask to Europe, USA, our diplomatic ally and good friends, and more than 80 countries in the world. And in addition to the uh, pandemic containment, any pandemic, we should also care about this uh, economic activity and vitality. So the government allocated uh, $410 billion for epidemic control, financial relief, and economic vitality. And we shift the uh, spending priority to emergency uh, measures and increased government investment and procurement. And we also accelerate foreign and private investment and we maintained our foreign exchange market stability and stock market uh, momentum. And as you can see, uh, from the very beginning, the government has um, ensured 
that the public has open access to COVID-19 information, and we have a daily press briefing. And in this way, CECC, our center, our command center, quickly established its authority. So it gained the public trust, and this creates a virtual cycle of good governance and good citizenship, and to have a very good control of the containment of COVID-19. In the future, I think that uh, for the containment of future pandemic, we need a global solidarity and international collaboration. Infectious disease respect no border. Any pandemic of emerging infectious is detrimental to global health, economic development, social stability, national security, and regional peace. No country can fight the pandemic alone. So transparency and honesty are the best policy. I think that an uh, World Health Organization may play a better coordinating role uh, with professionalism and political neutrality. And we urge no health nationalism and no deglobalization. And for the COVID-19 impact on industry, uh, we know that a lot of industry, including transportation, tourism, uh, physical entertainment, and uh, physical retail has been affected seriously. So in Taiwan, uh, we keep this kind of uh, financial assistance to help the uh, economic revitalize. So post COVID-19, we consider that for the economic development in Taiwan, we are going to engage in big health, zero touch economy, flexibility of labor market and Taiwan innovation of entrepreneurship and data driven services and so forth. And as you can see for the healthcare, we try to use artificial intelligence in our healthcare and in Taiwan, our ICT industry also involved in healthcare. In the, and uh, the new technology for the strategic uh, epidemic prevention in the future should include the diagnosis therapy, disinfection, healthcare, and telemedicine. And the, the new application of the strategies to uh, epidemic prevention should include environmental health, smart city, manufacturing industry, as well as the individual need. And this, um, the last but then the last part I would like to share with you uh, on this uh, platform of COVID-19 uh, development. COVID-19 vaccine development, uh, basically this uh, pandemic has facilitated the development of vaccine platform distinct from the classic uh, classical vaccine. Classical platform can be divided by uh, virus-based and protein-based. But this time, the next generation platform, including the viral vector vaccine, nuclear acid-based vaccine, and antigen-presenting vaccine are doing quite well. So uh, as you can see, there are three uh, platforms has been engaged to generate uh, to produce that's an RNA vaccine, subunit vaccine, and viral vector vaccine. In Taiwan, we have two com uh, companies engaged in this uh, uh, viral uh, uh, vector vaccine, the vaccine development. And this is the RNA vaccine by Pfizer Biotechnology and Bi BioNTech and Moderna. And you can see the distribution of these two companies' vaccine. And for the adenovirus vector vaccine, and that's an ask for AstraZeneca, that's a Sputnik, and Johnson and Johnson, and Camidesia. And you can see that most of the country are using the adenovirus vector vaccine now. And for the inactivated virus vaccine, that's a, including this Sinopharm, Coronavac, Covaxin, and Covivac. And the, another is this protein subunit vaccine. And I would like to share with you that in many countries now, except in Africa, already have this uh, approved of this uh, vaccine for the use. And uh, this slide shows the COVID-19 vaccine dose administered per 100 person. And as you can see, the best coverage is in Israel, followed by United Arab uh, Emirates, and by Chile and United Kingdom and so forth. And if we look at this data uh, from the uh, Israel, and as you can see, they started the vaccination program uh, last December, mid December, and you can see that's a rapid decline of the instance of COVID-19 cases after the 20 uh, of the January 
and also the reduced in mortality. And this slide shows the effectiveness of this uh, the vaccination uh, uh, to reduce the instance and mortality in UK. So immunization definitely is very important. And I would like to, uh, the last, I would like to share with you that now we need to uh, try ourselves to help each other and we should not have any kind of uh, spirit of vaccine nationalism and we should try to help to every country to have a universal distribution and global solidarity through international cooperation is the key for the prevention and control of future pandemic or emerging infectious disease. With that, I would like to uh, conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. For sharing with us your in-depth experience in ra rapid response to COVID-19. This is one of the great examples to see how the individual country could handle crisis if they are resilient and technology self-reliance. So thank you again, Professor Shen, and I'm sure that we will have a lot to discuss later on. Our second speaker... Let me see. ...is Professor Hassan Mandal. President of Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey, to be talk. In addition, he, he also served as the president of the Global Engineering Dean's Council, the first vice president of the International Federation of Engineering Education Societies, and the president of the European Ceramic Society, just to name a few. Today, he will give a talk on co-creating and succeeding together toward sustainable development in the post-COVID-19 world. Please welcome President, uh, Professor Hassan Mandal. Okay, so, uh, so good afternoon uh, or good morning. Uh, so, dear uh, NASTA president, um, and also go, uh, is a good colleague, is uh, Dr. Naron, and uh, uh, I'm a distinguished panelist, um, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, it's a great pleasure to come together in the President's Forum of the NASTA with the focus on, uh, on a, such an uh, important topic of our future. Realizing that the circular green economy is a challenge for all of us, uh, and it's going to be turned into the opportunities for, for the post-COVID-19 world. With a focus on realizing this transition, I would like to now uh, share my presentation. And uh, I mean, it's already been uh, I mean, uh, named is the co-creating and succeeding together towards the sustainable development in the post-COVID-19 world. Um, I mean, looking for the transformation uh, on, on R&D and innovation ecosystem in global sense, and especially considering the fact of the COVID-19. So the type of, um, I mean, uh, innovation or in a sense of the, I mean, uh, knowledge creation to the knowledge user, it used to be in, in one way, but the, the change in the ecosystem is, from linear to reiterative. So knowledge creator and knowledge user are working together. It's a reversible type of interaction. And the type of challenges which we are having now is, is COVID-19. And we are uh, unfortunately may have some other much difficult challenges in the future. So therefore type of solutions uh, is not only in a sense of a technological way, it is including the, some other disciplines as well. So the type of challenge, it can be only be handled with a, a systematic type of approach in an other sense with open innovation. And in this respect, the type of interaction, so in this respect also this meeting is giving a, I mean, uh, the right forum that the, the I mean, uh, the, the, the difficult challenges um, and this could be only over, um, I mean, overcome by means of co-creation, so rather than the collaboration. So I think this is a, what we have been learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. So more than the collaboration, co-creation is needed to overcome the uh, global challenges. 
And on the basis of the topic of the sustainable development and also taking reference to SDGs for UN, uh, so how the life can be changed. So this could be either, um, I mean, uh, transformative improvements uh, or business as usual. So, so therefore, the type of, I mean, uh, contribution which I am going to give uh, during the discussion um, is it's, it is more co-creation based of approach and this changing the ecosystem on the basis of the transformative improve, improvements rather than the business as usual scenario. And before going to the detail of my uh, contribution, so I would like to say only with one a few slides on who I am. Uh, I mean, uh, representing the Turkish Scientific and Technological Research Council is which our role is the main funding agency for science, technology and innovation in, in Turkey. Um, and also we are responsible for the representation of Turkey in uh, international collaborations uh, on, on science, technology and innovation area. And in a, in a in other sense as well, in one side we are the we are uh, we are funding agency, and in the other side we are also doing the research on critical areas, and uh, with by means of the 23 institutes, uh, more than uh, 4,500 research personnel, um, and on the critical uh, areas, uh, which I mean the, the development of the vaccine. Uh, and the uh, uh, drug development is one of the issue of uh, our uh, strategic approaches of this uh, within uh, the, our role of, on within these 23 institutes. Um, and in terms of the change of the ecosystem in, in Turkey, uh, especially in the recent years, I mean, bef even before the COVID-19 pandemic, so changing the, as a funding agency, so we are changing the ecosystem from more input oriented, which means that uh, creating the potential, more than creating the potential, concentrate on the, uh, the outcomes and also the impact of the research. And in this way, so how it is possible, which it needed to be new knowledge creation uh, techniques and also new, um, I mean, way to for the human uh, resources development. And so this is the change in our ecosystem uh, in a sense of the, by means of the co-creation based new knowledge and co-creation based new human resources development. And what does it mean? Uh, I mean, as the funding agency uh, in Turkey, so instead of funding the individual projects, especially the type of challenges, for example, I, I'll give an example for COVID-19. So we are uh, funding the platforms. So the funding the platform means that the all the stakeholders, the relevant stakeholders, are using the I mean uh, the, I mean uh, the same infrastructure. I mean joint inf uh, company infrastructure and also even sharing the human capacity. Uh, so this uh, I mean this is the way, especially for emerging countries like Turkey and the Thailand. So this is the which we think that is the right way to be overcome the challenges. And um, also in the right hand side, so you can see the type of way uh, for the human development. For example, in the right hand side, in the, in the bottom right hand side, so there's, a, I mean, a program has been introduced, is industrial PhD program. So, I mean, it used to be PhD is only be employed by the academy. Now, I mean, we are changing the ecosystem to PhD holder, also is going to be employed by the companies by means of this PhD program. And I think it's one of the unique in a sense that the funding program is not only limiting during the PhD period, is also including the employment stage. So during the employment stage, the, the TÜBİTAK, the funding agency is also, uh, I mean, covering the 60% of the salary of the PhD holder during the next three years. So by this way, so there's a transition from the uh, from the uh, I mean ecosystem, especially for moving from medium high to the high technologies, and also in terms of I mean inviting the international outstanding uh, researchers around the globe, and also within the country in I mean outstanding researchers fellow program is is is, is giving also privilege to the I mean funding the special researchers for doing their best, um, I mean, uh, state of the, not, uh, I mean, uh, for the uh, kind of uh, uh, research that 
um, in, in a sense of the frontier. And also you can see the one of the uh, top topic agenda also relevant to the this uh, session on the green deal issue um, and turkey is one of the partner of the european commission um so uh, so uh, is the one of the top top topic in in in these days and especially for covid 19 is the green deal issue um in in in in, uh, in turkey in europe and globally um and so you can see this is the areas um, which we have been concentrate on, especially on uh, on the uh, this co-creation type of big platforms. So these are the areas which we have been working on it because these are the areas for moving from Turkey from the medium high to the high technology, and these are uh, the areas could be only be overcome or could be successful. Um, in, I mean, we, we, I mean, running the big platforms either for technology development or for the product development. Um, so, I mean, this is the one of the, I think, um, uh, I mean, uh, kind of an implementation. Uh, so, during the COVID-19 process, uh, I mean, we have been structured this co-creation platforms, uh, and we have been able to use during the pandemic. So, what does it mean? 49 institutions come together with 436 researchers, and within this 436 researchers, uh, half of them is the young uh, fellows, I mean, including the bachelor students. And within this, so 17 projects are running with, under the one platform and 32 uh, of the, these institutions from universities and eight of them from private companies, I mean, for the vaccine and drug development companies and nine uh, public R&D units. So 17 projects and seven of them for the vaccine and nine of them drug development and one of the drug has been uh, starting from the raw materials to the to the final one is already been uh, produced during the pandemic uh, i mean from the, since from june so we have been uh, producing our own drug for the treatment of the uh, covid-19 and from the seven vaccine projects um, and also explained from the previous speaker that, I mean, we have been working from the uh, special one, one of them is the inactive type of vaccine and the six of them, the new technology, biotechnological type of vaccines. And one of them is on the phase study, I mean, the clinical trials now on the VLP type of uh, vaccine now is, is on the uh, clinical trials. And um, in terms of the, um, I mean, uh, type of uh, international collaboration, so so you can see in this map that with the green areas, uh, Turkey, I mean, Tubitak is uh, working together with the relevant partners, uh, and um, and the NASTA um, is, is one of the, um, I mean, um, organization which we have been working very uh, fruitfully, and uh, I mean, we have been started very recently. Um, in, in, in 2019, and we have been already been open a call, and uh, there is a great interest from the both countries, and we are looking forward for the future as well. And regarding to the, I mean, for the topic that I mean, so I mean, it is very much relevant to the SDGs, sustainable development, and the uh, and the uh, the green economy, circular green economy, and especially the uh, SDG number 12 is the responsible consumption and production i think is much more relevant and also you can see that i mean the i mean how the ecosystem is changing which i have been already been shared in in, in my first slides and also how what is needed in i mean in, you can see in the in the right hand side um and a few um type of figures uh, regarding to the sdg number 12 um it is relevant to the, this session that the number of policies, uh, instruments, and mechanisms is putting in for the sustainable consumption and production um, and for the relevant company, for countries, which you can see from the slide. And many countries have a policy um, on, on, on the, on the uh, sustainable development uh, SDGs and especially number 12. And, uh, but at the meantime, there is a challenge, which for all of us, and uh, so while we are talking about all policies in one side, but in the other side, I mean, comparing the year 2010 and year 2017, uh, and still there is a, uh, I mean, is an increase in, in terms of the uh, type of, um, I mean, um, 
uh, type of the natural resources with the global material foot footprint. Um, I mean, it's increasing from uh, from the I mean, in a sense of 7.3 million metric tons to the uh, 80 85.9 billion uh, metric tons in 2017. So there is although although in one side there is a willingness and there's the policies, but in the other side, uh, I mean, the numbers are not uh, confirming this. And in, in, in maybe another example can be given also again for the SDG 12, based on the electronic waste recycling rate, uh, further requires the progress on based on R&D and innovation for shifting in direction for electronic waste generation. So you can see again in, in, in here that uh, I mean countries, the electronic waste recycling rate by country. Um, although I mean there is a, a good sign that I mean there is a, in terms of awareness and a type of uh, I mean, um, I mean, uh, uh, concentration on, on, on the topics uh, in that respect, but still, the, unfortunately, moving to the again to the uh, numbers in here, so we can see uh, there is a, I mean, an increase and is going. And for if it, so, uh, and in terms of, I mean, putting the, uh, I mean, kind of an agenda for, um, I mean, uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, here. 2050 so there is still a big increase in electronic waste for example um but in a sense that uh, either we we we take the policy as it is um or we check uh, we need to change the policy um i mean in in, in with, the, with the bottom line which you can see that i mean changing the policy and the changing the policy means that uh, we will change the ecosystem by means of an r&d based type of innovations to reduce sharply, otherwise it, it will continue to increase or it can be stay as it is. So, uh, but the way is has been given there. So we have been uh, uh, changed the policy and also we can, uh, this and also could be only possible, um, I mean, not only on the base of the one discipline, so the basic science, engineering science and social science, they all should come together. So you can see the type of areas which need to be concentrated. So this is only possible in, in that respect. Um, and in, in the other side as well, uh, still talking about, um, I mean, um, uh, uh, sustainable materials that increase the possibility for circular economy. So in one side, we can see the uh, type of, I mean, primary production and still discarded uh, amount of the uh, I mean, output. So although we are trying to be, I mean, increasing the awareness, but in terms of the numbers, um, I mean, for the, I mean, we are doing the recycling, but still a long way to do uh, in terms of the I mean, numbers. It has been named in here uh, as a comparison, as a discarded world, I mean, uh, over uh, primary production ratio. Um, and also, I will put your attention again and comparing the, I mean, uh, the synthetic plastics in between year, I mean, 1950 and uh, 2015. And you can see, uh, I mean, before 2015, uh, and 6.3 gigaton. But I mean, only during the last two years between 2015 and 17, and uh, you can see the, that sharp increase. Um, and this, again, how it is possible, um, um, I mean, in, in, in a sense, uh, to ability to remain with the ecological boundaries with our planet by decoupling economic, uh, economic growth by environmental pressures. Um, so it depends on, again, the realization of the circular bioeconomy. So again, in, in here, uh, you can see it taken all um, senses. So it is not only one, I mean, um, one aspect. So it's covering the, all aspects, uh, including the new business model uh, to the decouple the prosperity from the consumption of the products in all sectors. And also, for example, as a, myself as a material scientist, also I can give an, some examples there. Uh, so the nanocellulose, food-based textiles, and of course laminate timber. So these are the maybe kind of a, an, an example, even a biomaterial compared to the, the, plastics, the plastics in in the previous slide. Um, and looking for the, I mean, uh, kind of a, I mean, ecosystem on a scientific way. So what are the, I mean, when we are talking about the circular economy, so what are the type of areas is coming? So it is in one side the critical raw materials, and in the other side is the supply chain management. So, so in that respect, again, so the the overcoming the or um, I mean uh, this issue um, on sustainable development, 
um, and especially for the SDG number 12, it's going to be overcome with the co-creation type of um, uh, efforts, which means that bringing the all disciplines together. And in here, so we can see, and we can in, in here, so we are talking about uh, a, not a triple uh, helix model, it's a quadruple helix, uh, helix model, so which means that the universities, private sector, government, and the society should come together uh, to, to, to work on, on, on this issue. And in, in, in that, uh, by this way, so we can be able to be, I mean, uh, to work on, uh, I mean, starting from the effective use of raw materials, opportunities for the material recovery, from waste to shifting to the supply chain towards the more sustainable sources requires change in the collaborative approaches. So, and in a sense that, I mean, if this um, way uh, of the co-creation of the, uh, the quadruple helix model, um, it, this only be possible. And again, in, in, in, in the right-hand side, so you can see the building a circular economy together with the co-creation. So, I mean, in, in, in the different aspects of the, um, I mean, uh, of the challenge. Um, and in, here again, I mean, comparing the type of disciplines um, uh, should be, and also the distribution of the sector. So, so when we are talking about on this issue, so it's covering the many, many, many disciplines and on the basis of the scientific outcomes, I mean, on, on the previous slide, which I have been shared, and also in terms of the looking for the, for the sectors, I mean, it's affecting the many sectors, uh, so, and some of them is very critical. Uh, some of them may be as a kind of a principle or some of them is a, a enabled uh, type of effects. And, um, um, and looking for, um, uh, I mean, a kind of a, a transition in a circular bioeconomy based on a resource efficiency, sustainable supply chains and biomass with carbon capture and storage will provide, a, I mean, new revenues and also the jobs by 2030. So in, the, in, in, in one side, we all talk about on, on challenges, but in the other side, if we can all, I mean, work on a co-creation type of model, so there is a good opportunity in terms of uh, new revenues. I mean, you can see in here 2030, the type of, I mean, uh, I mean uh, billions, and also in terms of a uh, new type of job opportunities, again, by uh, 2030, uh, in terms of the, I mean, 70, 80, 87 million uh, new job opportunities on the base of the, um, I mean, the uh, green economy. Um, and so by this way, so I'll say that, I mean, all the efforts, I mean, although either we are working on COVID-19 or working on the, uh, I mean, by a circular green economy on the basis of the sustainable uh, development. Um, so the type of an impact is becoming more and more important. So, I mean, whatever the area which we are working and in this respect, so which we think that definitely, the, I think that one of the key words uh, is is is to work by co-creation rather than the collaboration so once more i thank you very much for the invitation and i hope that i mean i make a kind of an um, i mean contribution to the to the topic of the uh, of the of the panel thank you very much indeed professor mandal for your insightful information we are pleased to learn the co-creation platform of turkey that can also be applied in many areas, including response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are also glad to learn from your talk that Turkey and Thailand have similar approaches to move towards sustainable development. And we definitely could learn more from each other in the future. Thank you again, Professor Mandal. Now I'd like to move to the, our third speaker, Professor Joachim Wang Brown, Director of the Center of Development Research, Bond University. He is a co-chair of the International Committee on Bioeconomy. During 2002 to 2009, he was a director general of the International Food Policy Research Institute based in Washington, DC. He was elected as president of the International Association of Agriculture Economists. Professor Joachim will deliver a speech on bioeconomy policy. So please welcome Professor Joachim. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Naron Silad uh, Vorakul, uh, the president, uh, congratulations to this event and thank you for the invitation. 
Biocircular green economy is uh, an excellent and timely theme. Thailand is one of the leaders in bioeconomy. I'm also pleased to join the panel with Professor Chen, um, who uh, lectured uh, us on the opportunities of comprehensive health and innovation approaches to deal with pandemics. Uh, Professor Chen, it was good to hear you again. Uh, you gave us a wonderful talk at the Pontifical Academy of Science in the Vatican uh, not long ago. Professor Mandal, the opportunities of science-based green deal strategies and co-creation, a great topic. And I look forward to listen to uh, colleague uh, Professor Tonti Zirin, uh, who I know as a leader in nutrition. Excellencies, colleagues, uh, the bioeconomy aims at reconciling the needs of humans and nature. Based on science and innovation, it pursues an economic system that is superior to today's. One that strives for achieving the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and one which is based on sustainable economic growth, which centers on improving human well-being and social equity while reducing resource consumption and regenerating ecosystems. The bioeconomy is the production, utilization, conservation, and regeneration of biological resources, including related knowledge, science, technology, and innovation. This is how we defined bioeconomy uh, in a lengthy definition at the uh, International Council on Bioeconomy. Since its origins in the late 1960s, the concept has further evolved in scope and in direction around the world, and I want to touch on that and then relate it to the way forward. I report to you about the outcomes of the Global Bioeconomy Summit recently held in November 2020 with more than 3,000 participants, and Thailand played a key role. Those of you who are interested in details, go to our website of, of the summit called GBS, Global Bioeconomy Summit, gbs2020.net, and uh, you find beautiful presentations and conclusions there, and the conference report has just been published. At the moment, ladies and gentlemen, many bioinnovations are already demonstrating promising solutions with clear social health and ecological benefits. Pioneering examples in the healthcare sector comprise biological therapeutics, for instance, immuno-oncology, biodegradable implants, sensors, uh, as well as bioprinted organs. In the textile and fashion industry, bioinnovations contribute to sustainable materials and processes, for instance, biotechnologically produced spider silk, probably not competing with Thai silk, bio-based water repellents or bio-based dyeing and washing processes, saving energy. In the IT sector, DNA has already been tested successfully for super efficient data storage and cells have been merged with chips to diagnose air pollution. Artificial intelligence and robotics are facilitating bioeconomy. They belong together. Bioinnovators in the food and feed industry have developed probiotic health products, new protein options, high value products from food waste and side streams, as well as microbiome solutions for agriculture, such as microbial based fertilizers and for combating obesity and non-communicable diseases for better animal feed and human health. In industry, ladies and gentlemen, synthetic biology and applications of Microbiome engineering not only result in advanced biomaterials replacing plastics and steel, but also inspire more sustainable manufacturing processes. Biotechnology and related converging technologies provide remarkable potential to advance sustainable development and to accelerate job creation through innovative startups and global participation. 
A sustainable bioeconomy, however, requires that we produce in a different way, circular instead of linear, and by using science to add value to biological resources and biological processes. With its inspiration from nature, the bioeconomy embraces principles of renewability, circularity, and cascade resource use. The bioeconomy can be compatible with and may contribute to the development of a circular economy where resources are used as long and as efficient as possible and waste is limited or repurposed. Circularity, not per se, is sustainable. It depends on the environmental footprint of the circularity. The same applies to bioeconomy. We need sustainable, as you call it, green circular bioeconomy. Sustainable bioeconomy development involves broadening our use of bioresources. The bioeconomy and circular economy both address sustainability uh, and seek to optimize product designs, material flows, and resource efficiencies while keeping a high level of functionality or adding new functionalities to materials. Startups around the world are pioneering innovative, resource efficient, and sustainable protein production, which is um, of huge importance given the tremendous environmental footprint of the protein feed industry, uh, feeding uh, the meat and, uh, and other livestock productions um, for, uh, uh, around the world. Through the development of nutrient-rich products from algae or insects or by biotechnologically manufacturing in microorganisms using CO2 as carbon feedstocks, new proteins uh, may offer an, a game-changing solution to the protein problem. Large consumer goods companies are including bio-based product innovations in their portfolios from materials and packaging, functional textiles to cosmetics and children's toys. New processes and technologies such as bio-based 3D printing, biomimicry, bionics and robotics, large-scale technical use of CO2 for biomanufacturing with cell-free systems are increasingly applied and embedded in new industrial and urban concepts. Elements of bioprincipled cities, including algae houses, wooden buildings, waste processing systems, insect farms, or urban and indoor farming can be increasingly found all over the world, mostly still at experimental stage. The blue bioeconomy and ocean-based bioeconomy is an area of great innovation dynamism and of urgency to resolve pollution problems, including plastics in the oceans. Ladies and gentlemen, bioeconomy includes producers and consumers alike. The vision of a sustainable bioeconomy is to advance technological process and efficiency gains through science, technology, and innovation. This puts bioeconomy at the center of new industrial strategies. It's not a sector, the bioeconomy, it's a strategy a strategy for industry, farming, and so on. Transition to the bioeconomy is more critical than ever before. The urgency stems from the reality of environmental threats, the opportunities brought about by new science, and the consequences of COVID-19. The bioeconomy has emerged as a globally impactful, transformative force in industry and manufacturing on the supply side, and a transformative force for consumption change and waste reduction on the demand side. We have to overcome waste. In recent years, the strong adaptive capacity of bioeconomy to national and local circumstances have been demonstrated. Bioeconomy strategies happen at the local level. Bioeconomy regions develop all over the world. We have about 50 bioeconomy regions in Europe adapted to local demand and supply and technology capabilities. Countries' bioeconomy opportunities differ 
there are opportunities in all countries for bioeconomy transformations, uh, regardless of income levels and natural resource endowments. In concluding, referring to the recent Global Bioeconomy Summit held in November 2020, we urged the strengthening of the following five actions for policy. First, capitalize on the power of science and technology. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed a new demand for innovation with the opportunity for synergies between medical research, agricultural materials, energy, and food science. A global bioeconomy will increasingly benefit from the merging of bioscience and digitization and by supporting circular economy processes and green growth. The link between um, COVID-19 pandemic and um, uh, the livestock industry and how um, um, human, humankind relates to nature and, um, and those uh, animals which carry viruses and that linkage needs to be broken uh, with uh, redesign of our livestock industries. Bioeconomy, secondly, bioeconomy jobs through partnership and innovation need to be fostered. It's our second conclusion. Bioeconomy holds opportunity for the creation of new sustainable jobs, both rural and, uh, and semi-rural and urban areas. Investment in training use and capacity building can ensure that workers and entrepreneurs adapt to new biomarkets and bio-related technologies. So I emphasize the need to bring the bioeconomy in, in, in a holistic way into the curricula of higher education. Third, increasing involvement of industries and business. Political commitment and proactively leveling the playing field for bio-based businesses is what we call for um, remo removing subsidies uh, for non-sustainable production, tax exemptions, uh, et cetera, may be the right incentives. Fourth, promoting resilient value chains. COVID uh, pandemic has um, demonstrated how vulnerable international value chains are. However, we need to continue to exploit the opportunities of trade and division of labor in global value chains, but they need to become a, a lot more robust and resilient. Bioeconomy reconciles local and global integration and offers opportunities of resilient and adapt adaptable supply chains. Fifth and last, a circular green bioeconomy is a framework towards which the agri-food system is to be transformed. In addition to single policy instruments, such as carbon prices, um, progress in the bioeconomy requires comprehensive and context-specific systems frameworks that pay attention to um, good governance designs. The Food Systems Summit of the United Nations uh, later this year, uh, called for by the Secretary General of the United Nations, is the big opportunity to integrate food systems transformation with bioeconomy. Asia's partnership and voice in these forums is going to be of global importance. The UN Food Systems Summit and the Climate Conference, the upcoming COP26 this year, need to be connected. Biocircular bio green economy serves both a sustainable food system and overcoming the climate change threats in a post-COVID context. Mr. President and um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your attention. Professor Joachim, for your presentation. And we are very impressed to learn how bioeconomy policy has impact on the societal, technological, and also economic transformation. That's very valuable. Thank you very much. Again, Professor Joachim. Now, our last speaker is Professor Emeritus Dr. Kraisit Tantik Sirin, Senator and former Director of Food and Nutrition Division, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And Professor Kraisit will present on the topic of 
Food and Agriculture. Please welcome Professor Gracie. Thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to be invited to join this uh, President's Lecture. And obviously, I'm quite pleased to see Jo Him, who I have not seen for maybe more than 10 years. And your lecture has made my lecture maybe uh, easier. Uh, of course, I will emphasize on practical aspect that you have already uh, covered uh, the bigger picture. Uh, may I start with uh, my uh, presentation? Of course, I try to divide my uh, presentation into two parts. The first part is an uh, introduction of the actual situation uh, in the world and also in Thailand. And then go detail on practical aspect that we are doing in Thailand during the last five or six years on food and agriculture aspect. And then later on try to link with bio circular green economy in food and agriculture. And end up briefly with the linkage uh, of sufficiency economy philosophy given by His Majesty the King Rama Nai, uh, BCG and SDG, and in conclusion. Uh, as we know from uh, the information uh, that we gather, uh, food and agriculture are fundamental for livelihood, social, culture dimension, and also tourism. Uh, food and nutrition security, of course, meaning uh, all people are able to access physically, socially, or economically to uh, save nutritious uh, food, uh, to maintain a healthy life in a, a positive environment with uh, clean water and sanitation. And then decent job and economic uh, opportunities, e ecological and environmental sustainability. And also food and agriculture sector contribute for achieving SDG2 directly. But as uh, Johim mentioned, uh, this is a bio economy. It can uh, cover uh, SDG1, ending poverty, and also SDG3, uh, good health and well-being, and other. And, and, and as I mentioned in my slides here, food and agriculture are closely related to bio circular and green economy. Uh, according to uh, data from FAO um, in various uh, documents, and also related to SDG, and also some from OECD, that around 800 million people are hunger, and around 100 million more uh, during COVID pandemic. Obviously, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, all measure will affect livelihood, job, and, uh, and also ecology. And uh, two million people do not consume enough vitamin and mineral or micronutrient deficiency. And then 1.4 billion people are overweight and 500 million obese. And are, as a consequence, uh, non communicable disease are highly prevalent worldwide, not only the poor country, but also the rich country. Uh, crop and livestock pro production use over 70% of all water withdrawal and 30% globally in food system. And agriculture uh, production account for 11% of greenhouse gas. And also other part in food system from uh, processing transportation also accounted for five to 10% uh, of greenhouse gas. Food loss and food waste have been around 30% based on FAO, if we can reduce this loss and waste, people will have more food for food security. And since uh, people are living longer, uh, they're also looking for so-called healthy diet and, uh, and also food supplement or functional ingredients. With regard to Thailand situation, uh, in fact, the population uh, lately, it's a uh, six 66 million people, somewhat declining slowly uh, because of low birth rate. Thailand has been well known uh, as one 
a good example uh, uh, of the success story in reduction of matter and shy malnutrition during the 80s. And um, however, we are now facing with a double burden of malnutrition, some remnant, remnant of undernutrition and rising trend of overnutrition and uh, non commercial disease. We are fortunate that we are a major food exporter, but we could do better with BCG model as a transformation, uh, food and agriculture. Uh, with regard to Thailand, we now have critical situation that, uh, that document at the revised national reform plan uh, this year. It was mentioned that 27 million people involved in agriculture and even Thailand ranked number 11 global food export. But our productivity uh, are quite low compared to other country and also low efficiency. And uh, million, 11 million people employed in agriculture uh, or around 30% of labor force, but they contribute only 8% of GDP. So we use a lot of land, a lot of labor, but GDP is rather low. Uh, agriculturists and farmers continue to, to, to live in the so-called low-income group with the burden receiving government uh, support almost every year, particularly supporting of uh, six uh, so-called economic crops. So we have to do something on that too. And productivity per uh, people employed in agriculture recently appear to be uh, quite low in terms of growth rate, 1.9% per year. Uh, I would like to share with you the, the, the thought and the plan that we have uh, been doing under the National Food Committee. And this uh, uh, strategic framework has been uh, adopted by the cabinet and then uh, chair with other sector. Of course, uh, it still uh, need to be uh, implemented further. Uh, our vision is Thailand ensure food and nutrition security and also sustainable source of nutritious and safe food with premium quality for Thai and the world. So as a consequence, we emphasize a lot on uh, food and nutrition. It's a bio uh, economy uh, for uh, income and also for social, as well as for environment. Uh, this diagram is a holistic approach that we uh, developed during the planning. That agriculture involves food and non-food. Uh, and then from, uh, from farm, it goes to processing and trade and consumption. Uh, at the end, we expect for consumer health and well-being and environmental sustainability and economic uh, prosperity. And uh, so the whole food system, we have to emphasize on safe food, premium quality, and nutritional quality that uh, consumer uh, demand for. With regard to uh, farming, we emphasize still very basic uh, zoning based on data information of history of uh, production, uh, culture, and also yield. So we should emphasize on this. And then uh, farmer, uh, smart farmer, smart farming, using uh, knowledge uh, technology. In fact, NASDAQ has implemented this uh, in rural area as a, a learning uh, area. Then good agriculture practice mandatory. And in this regard, we will be able to increase productivity and also we can trace the product based on traceability. Uh, with regard to uh, processing, we emphasize, of course, at how show based on knowledge, uh, based on local uh, or, or top product, uh, one tambon, one area uh, of commodity uh, per, per one product, SME, and also industry. Uh, with regard to trade and consumption of fish, of course, we emphasize on the outlet, restaurant, and also food service and workplace. And uh, 
food production have to respond to consumer uh, demand so that uh, we will not have to waste as uh, Johim mentioned, balancing between the supply and demand has to be considered consider seriously. And then uh, the, at the bottom, we have to think about value chain. Now, the, the, uh, the, uh, the reform emphasizes a, a lot about high value added product, logistic efficiency. Thailand has been uh, used a lot of uh, uh, car or road transportation. Uh, logistic efficiency is very low uh, instead of using a uh, uh, train or water. So we, we have to use this more. And then, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, food loss and waste are still highly prevalent. Of course, the loss is uh, during production. The waste is uh, uh, during uh, consumption. Still a problem. Uh, we try to use uh, uh, this uh, waste product uh, for many things. And then we also try to strengthen linkage between individual sector. This is the most difficult. Of course, we, we try to, to emphasize a lot of decentralization or area-based, emphasizing on cooperation between 5P, public, private, professional, and also people partnership. And one of the most important issues is fair income distribution. So that farmer will receive adequate income uh, from their production. Uh, at the bottom, it required technology, research, and innovation, and also capacity building. Then, as I mentioned earlier, we have to emphasize on area and setting base. So decentralization in management at grassroots level is required, then followed by monitoring and evaluation. Uh, in summary, uh, of this uh, concept, uh, we emphasize on food and nutrition security, economic opportunity, social culture, and tourism. And then uh, environmental sustainability that will link uh, very well with uh, SDG. With regard to food chain that we emphasize in research and practice, land use based on soil quality, water management of too much water, too less water, and also water quality, and then microclimate. So we have to understand the local situation about food and agriculture, and a database may, may, may be needed. Then uh, the, the second uh, layer is uh, genetic resources. This again requires a lot of research, including basic research. Then nutrition for plant and animal, how to provide a fertilizer, how to provide a proper animal feed with economic uh, benefit. Then we have to think about a plant and disease control. Nowadays, one issue that the world are facing, is facing is antimicrobial resistance. So if we consider as a one, one health, human health, animal health, and plant health, so using of antimicrobial have to be prudent so that we will not have uh, microorganism that resist to uh, antibiotic or chemical substance. And then move up. We have to promote good agriculture practice. It's like the record, record of the farm. When we see patients, we have to have medical record of individual person. So in, in agriculture, we have to promote good agriculture practice so that we can trace the product uh, where it comes from. Then good hygienic practice, good management practice, safe and nutritious food. So these are the chain that we have to increase the value. Uh, coming back to the food security. So we have to ensure sustainable food and nutrition security uh, as a fundamental for by all economy. Basic first, by effective management of food production uh, resources, and also active stakeholder. Farmer, they just produce food in many areas of the world for subsistence economy. So if they are learn how to manage and have business thinking, they, they can join in and then they can do it. So of course, with regard to natural, uh, natural and uh, agricultural resources, we have to balance between uh, conservation and utilization that I will come back in the later then management and also 
uh, equitable access to uh, production resources. With regard to production, I mentioned earlier about zoning, smart farmers, smart farming, based on knowledge and technology, balancing between food, feed, fuel, and then increased productivity, particularly for healthy diet that are increasing demand. And then, of course, reduction of loss, uh, make use of uh, loss and waste for something else. Then distribution, uh, improvement of logistics. Uh, again, uh, technology research innovation along the food chain. And then also partnership uh, at national level and also regional and also international level for food security and nutrition. It's a big global issue. At for subsistence economy, uh, for household food security, uh, the King Pumipon also provides his land use theory advice. 10% uh, of the land, even if it's small, but, but of course it's not too small, uh, they can use for a house, garden, and also animal, small animal uh, production. And then 30% for vegetable and fruit, 30% for uh, cereal and 30% for uh, water reservoir and aquaculture. So this will be strengthening household food security. So if they produce together, become a bigger farm or cooperative, it becomes a business model. Uh, with regard to the second theme about food quality and safety, the codec principle has been applied here uh, to ensure high quality and safe food to protect consumer health and also to facilitate domestic trade. So value chain, uh, uh, implementing uh, commodity standard and also process standard should be promoted. Eventually, the food will be in high quality and safe for consumer and also for trade. Then the, the, the, the, at the center, food standard quality, safe and nutrition have to be uh, implemented at primary uh, production and then also industry for value added. As mentioned, as you see in the slides, research and development innovation are everywhere. For research and education, again, along the food chain, starting from uh, soil, quality water, and uh, genetic resources up to uh, nutrition, safe food. Uh, so we expect to have knowledge, technology, and innovation. And then, uh, again, uh, joy, uh, uh, the term that uh, one, uh, the first previous presentation, it's a co uh, creative and also core economy. And then uh, uh, through partnership, uh, extension service, again, university and uh, academic institution can provide extens extension service because Ministry of uh, Agriculture do not have enough power, manpower. And then teleconsultation can um, come in, area-based approach, value chain approach. And then eventually we have to promote eating behavior, consuming healthy diet. With regard to management, I will not go into detail but because it's very complex. As Shohim mentioned, we may have to think about uh, regulatory uh, reform to, to be a uh, to be friendly and to facilitate the reform. And then with some organization structure uh, down to the community uh, instead of uh, centralized management. And, and uh, with, data, uh, with regard to database, we need a uh, management information system, uh, big data for management so that a uh, farmer consumer can use the, that data system. Uh, now I come to the second part of my presentation that uh, will, with, uh, with regard to BCG, uh, it will be in Thailand we expect that it will be a model for sustainable development. Of course, it emphasizes on B by O as Joachim mentioned uh, nicely. And then uh, circular economy and green. Green uh, convey the meaning of sustainability. And uh, of course, my presentation confined to food and agriculture and then backed up by science, technology, and innovation. 
<laughs> and this diagram, I, I, I, I drew it after reading a, a magazine from a, a Herald Tribune about research innovation from science to commercialization. Because we start from science, technology, engineering, manufacturing, commercialization, and then research and innovation at the center. It can be done at all uh, level, from the top uh, down to the bottom, even down to the community. Uh, and the, const the, the philosophy that given by uh, the late King Rama the Nai uh, is very, very helpful, useful to live in this world happily. Happily. Uh, and also, it can be prosperous with the concept of middle path in moderation. In moderation, of course, uh, SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production, can be applied here very well. Of course, it can be moderation in many things uh, based on those SDG. And then uh, whatever we do, we have to be reasonable based on knowledge, information. And then cell immunity, meaning uh, we have to consider the risk. For example, if one wants to be rich with a lot of greed, and then it takes a lot of risk. And then uh, the fundamental for, for uh, this philosophy is knowledge and wisdom. Uh, so research, innovation, we can fit in here. Then eventually, ethic and morality. When we check the organization or the society, we can check by good governance report. And eventually, if we practice this at individual, uh, uh, household and also community, or even society, or we can, we can make a progress in balanced and stable and a sustainable way. So uh, SEP has been promoted a lot for the success of SDG. That's why uh, BCG can bridge in between SEP and also uh, uh, SDG. With regard to SDG, uh, many of us have family at this. But I just would like to emphasize again that food and agriculture are fundamental for good health, good nutrition, and well-being, and also a main part of the society, main part of the biological uh, the development. It will help not only achieving uh, good health, uh, the zero hunger, but many, many uh, aspects of, S, uh, of SDG. So, uh, only a few more slides. Bioeconomy in food and agriculture. Just share you with an example. High value added production to meet the high standard and also a production of innovative uh, product uh, or ingredient for consumer. Uh, increased productivity and efficiency throughout the chain. Modality, as I mentioned many times, zoning uh, or area based, smart farmers, smart farming. Uh, cooperative or promote cluster, and then investment uh, more on research innovation uh, along the food chain extension service, and then uh, to promote high quality with organic product, GI product, or uh, and also uh, information for management. With regard to circular economy, again many uh, previous speaker mentioned about reduce loss and waste, or reuse uh, of food packaging or food contact material, and uh, recycle uh, of waste converted to value-added product by research and innovation, like bio-fertilizer, bio-fuel, bio-degradable food contact. Food ingredient, one very good example in Thailand is uh, using of tuna uh, core product. So, so I involved as uh, one advisor for the last uh, five, six years. And um, this year I received a box of, of gift that it's a value-added product, a tuna calcium. Based on research, that the particle is smaller than red cell and uh, uh, bioavailability is very high. I'm not promoting 
<laughs> the product for them, but I just would like to show example. And then also some peptide, fish oil, and also some uh, hydrolysate. And uh, clean economy, use renewable energy, and use biodegradable and recycle of food packaging and food contact material. And uh, with regard to forest, we have to protect and conserve uh, forest for biodiversity. There are many good examples in Thailand, Highland Development Project uh, of His Majesty the King Rama Denai with people participation. People can live uh, under the forest. In China, there is a big project on so-called economy under the forest. The, the, the, for, the land still belongs to the government, but they are, uh, people are allowed to use those land uh, to protect uh, and conserve the forest, even grow plant tree, but they can grow some economic crop like tea, coffee, and herb spice. And then uh, also uh, they can use for tourism. So my conclusion is that linking with SPEP, the BCG economy will enhance and guide the transformation of food and agriculture for achieving uh, SDG, many, many SDG, particularly uh, one, two, three, uh, ending uh, poverty, hunger, and also good health and well-being, and also development, sustainability. Key success are human resources, management uh, throughout the food chain to improve productivity, and also value-added product. Uh, an innovative product, of course. And then uh, we require investment and supported by science, technology, research, and innovation. We should share and learn our knowledge and experiences uh, at various levels, community, uh, national, and also international uh, for achieving uh, ultimate goal is SDG that we have only uh, less than 10 years now. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Greisit, for your presentation. We truly appreciate your presentation mentioning SEP given by His Majesty the late King Pumipon Adunyade, which will be the main principle for BCG leading to the achievement of the SDGs. Now it's time for an open discussion. We would like to invite our panelists online to have your camera on and only have your mic on when you wish to speak. For the audiences, join as attendees. Please kindly leave your questions in the Q&A box. Now please allow me to invite our moderator, Professor Prasit Prithapon Kanpim, Executive Vice President of NASDA. So the floor is your Professor Basit. Yeah. Good. good afternoon and good morning, uh, all participants and panelists and, and the keynote speaker. I would like to first uh, thank all the speakers for the very interesting and informative uh, lecture. And we, we are now open the, for the discussion, but before that, I would like to, to, to tell you that we have participants uh, registered participant of about 200, and and this is come from not not only Thailand and from many country in ASEAN. In total, it's about 10, 10 country that register from from international to to to this meeting. Uh, it it seems to be a, a great benefit of of online meeting <laughs> that people can actually log in and and and and and, and participate from far away. And we have invited a number of, of, of people who become the panelists that may be sharing together about the, the way that we are going on on BCG. Uh, these also include Professor uh, James Celio, uh, the president of Academia Sirica, which previously was, two years ago, was our, our, our keynote speaker. So, so welcome, Dr. Dr. Leo. Uh, I would open the floor for anybody who would like to, to, to give opinion or, or share your idea or question, please. In, 
in the center of the meeting is, is in the center of the of the screen is, is the president of the King Mongkut University of Technology, Thunbuli, Professor Suit. You are a key person in in Thailand. Would you like to say something about this this busy chief? Sorry. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, all participants. Uh, I got a lot of uh, viewpoint from all the lecture from our keynote speakers. I think uh, BCG is quite important for Thailand because uh, we are a food producer of, uh, of the world. So uh, we try to set up uh, the R&D program and also all the uh, political issue that can help uh, our uh, people to have a high value added uh, uh, product or uh, some service like uh, health service uh, that Thailand is uh, very popular. So uh, from all the opinion that I got, I think uh, uh, it's helped us a lot especially the the uh, ID work in the university. Thank you. Hi, Professor Leo. <clears throat> yes. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, congratulate you for a, a wonderful uh, forum again. And I appreciate uh, hearing uh, all the four speakers uh, giving the exciting uh, stories uh, about different aspects of uh, uh, sustainability uh, goals and the biocircular economy. Um, I would like to uh, get some uh, feedback from uh, all the speakers and perhaps all the participants as well about the role of uh, academics in this area, in biocircular green development, as well as the uh, sustainable goals. In particular, we know that uh, many of us uh, are uh, working with the uh, funding agencies. I was wondering in different countries, uh, how do you uh, fund this uh, type of activities? Is there special initiatives or do you work that into your regular funding? Okay, I'd like to, uh, get some uh, opinion from uh, different um, uh, uh, agencies or uh, people from different countries. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the good, really good question. <laughs> uh, we may try first to answer. <laughs> Professor Kaisit would, would, would answer first. <laughs> uh, I had been a member of uh, many university council. Uh, I used to motivate them, meaning motivate university, to commit or embrace and support for achieving uh, SDG goal. Of course, uh, it depends upon the, the, the specialty of university. For example, the uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology may select specialized area and then commit, and then support. Uh, from Mahidon University, for example, medical science may select SDG number uh, three first. And then a uh, uh, University of Agriculture, select uh, agriculture. Uh, commit and support, support in terms of research, support or in terms of human capacity development. And then in terms of research, it's very, very unique that once you have a research uh, the, the outcome, you have to promote transferring of uh, research and innovation uh, to a, a practitioner so that we can achieve a certain SDG target. So I, I just briefly, you, uh, briefly, nowadays it's good news that um, ranking indicator of university, they adopt a contribution of university or academic institution for achieving SDG. So that that that would be one example uh, to encourage university to engage in 
uh, working for achieving SDG. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Uh, I see. Hey. I understand that uh, Dr. Christensen have two questions or for the panelists, is it right? Uh, can I, sorry. Uh, I am Hassan Mandal. Can I also contribute to the same question? Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, to to answer the, I mean, uh, at least from, uh, from the Turkish funding agency part, um, so, I mean, we have been, uh, I think it's in a three category, maybe. I mean, uh, we have been a, a special calls, uh, national calls on respect to, I mean, uh, on the topic of, um, I mean, um, uh, circular economy and or, I mean, in, a, in a more general sense on the Green Deal. Um, and the second one, um, I mean, we are also introducing our all programs either for academic for industry, getting an extra point. I mean, the first one is a special call, but the second one is all our ordinary calls. I mean, it's covering the all subjects areas, but we are giving an extra point if uh, the, the researcher is dealing on, uh, on, on, on a green deal. So, uh, so 15% than the normal. And third one is on, on the, in the case of the, are either bilateral uh, or multilateral, uh, multinational type of, um, I mean, initiatives. So our common uh, language, which we prefer for our counterparts uh, in, in, in the um, re uh, respective country. So we are uh, opening the calls uh, on the base of the SDGs, because this is the, which we think that the common understanding, otherwise we can put a lot of topics uh, and make the discussion but if we are saying, especially for the, I mean, bilateral type of collaboration, so we are saying that, I mean, which type of solutions or, I mean, the research will be pointed out on relevance to the SDG number. So this is also giving a kind of a, a I mean, a common language and understanding. And for example, in the case of the NASTA, uh, I mean, we have been, uh, I mean, the last, um, call was on the topics of the, I mean, very, um, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, relevant to the, today, I mean, for the discussions on, we have been worked on the food security, biomaterials, um, and uh, medical sensors. So that one, especially the first and second one, uh, food security and biomaterials are, are relevant. So, I mean, we are looking for the, so, and also these areas, how relevant to the uh, solutions uh, or challenges of the SDGs? Um, Chair, may I? So, thank you very much, Professor Van Brau. Yep. Van Brau, I guess thank you. you... Yes, yes let me uh, make uh, two remarks. One is uh, uh, European uh, Commission funding for um, research into bioeconomy is um, significant and it's wide open for partnerships around the world. Um, so it's not just for European researchers. Um, partly that also applies for German bioeconomy funding. The first 10 years of uh, the bioeconomy initiatives in my country in Germany uh, were largely stimulated by public research funding, research and innovation funding. In the meantime, uh, uh, also um, uh, more funding in the private sector has come along. Um, we are not at a level that comparable to, uh, let's say, a California or so with uh, startup funding, uh, but uh, things happen in, in, uh, in that direction. More broadly speaking, um, what role science in, um, in this bioeconomy? I think there's good news. If we look at the United Nations Food System Summit uh, process, um, the UN leadership has appointed a special group of scientific advisors, 29 advisors, who shall shape 
the content and agenda and evidence base of the summit. That is new. So um, I think um, uh, it has been understood that sustainability and bioeconomy and circular economy are very knowledge intensive and that's why the role of science is growing and growing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, may I uh, answer some of the, uh, during the discussion about, about and, uh, President Liao has mentioned about this and, uh, uh, grant support for uh, BCG uh, economy and in Taiwan. Uh, basically, uh, the, the research grants and R&D grants came from three sources. The first one is governmental agency. Our uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology provides an, uh, a basic uh, research grant for uh, bio circular and green economy. And in addition to that, uh, if this is more applied site, then the grants can come from this uh, agriculture uh, council or from this uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare, as well as from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And the third part of this kind of R&D grants are from this uh, uh, private sectors. And for instance, for the vaccine development, that's an, uh, in our academic syndicate, we got this uh, governmental grant and from Ministry of uh, Science and Technology also have the grants for this uh, vaccine development and also for our economy and uh, Ministry of uh, uh, health and welfare, and of course, there's a uh, public-private uh, partnership. So basically, uh, the BCD uh, economy, uh, the, the research grants or development grants are from different uh, governmental agencies as well as private sectors in Taiwan. Very much. Thank you for, for, for sharing. Uh, we, we have a couple of questions from Dr. Christensen. Uh, we like to to ask, please. Thank thank you very much. Let me please first uh, congratulate uh, and the president of NSTDA for not only thirty years successful research, but also for organizing this symposium and this uh, circle that we have today. You have chosen excellent topics and uh, brilliant speakers. I'm very impressed about everything I heard. And um, I have two questions. Let me first explain who I am, please, first. Uh, I am the agricultural counselor at the German embassy here in Bangkok. And uh, I'm very interested in learning about agriculture, but also learning about uh, bioeconomy here in Thailand. And now I would like to pose my first question to Professor Joachim von, Bra von Braun. Uh, we know each other now, I calculated 30 years, I don't know if you remember, we were 30 years ago, we organized a, a, a conference in Malaysia on sustainable agriculture or sustainability in general, and you were still working at IFRI at that time, and I was a student. Now we meet again, and uh, my question is concerning bioeconomy and you highlighted very brilliantly the importance of knowledge, of research innovation, and you uh, pointed out that uh, nowadays uh, startups are bringing the new knowledge into practice, into life. I would like to ask you uh, about the importance of the role of uh, the policy, since I come from a political uh, institution. Uh, how important do you see uh, uh, the connection between a, a coherence of a bioeconomy policy to the inter interaction between different uh, ministries, for example, the Ministry of Research and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture? If I think back in, in Germany, um, the Minister of Research had done excellent work excellent research uh, done. And my Minister of Agriculture got interested, very interested in the moment when he learned that, that from this res uh, research results, his farmers could get gain an extra income. So 
So once he had learned about that, he was very interested to get connected to the Ministry of Re uh, Research in order to put life into bioeconomy. Can you, uh, can you confirm this? And how do you see the importance of policy uh, coherence in bringing uh, more life into bioeconomy? Happy to respond, as the chair permits. <clears throat> Hello. Is it one, one file, please. Okay, shall I respond? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Role of policy in this field of innovation is critical for setting standards, uh, facilitating uh, tax incentives, um, and uh, for providing uh, startup grants for innovative products. Um, that's on the supply side. On the demand side, the bioeconomy needs to be pulled um, because the, the products of the bioeconomy are not uh, finding the interest of the consumers and, um, uh, and other actors in the value chains, it doesn't grow. So um, initially, European bioeconomy policy has neglected the demand side of the bioeconomy. That's a lesson which I think we can tell. So that requires um, labeling, standard setting, information, education, even campaigning uh, to, that uh, um, to reduce waste, losses, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and yes, uh, um, the rural economy uh, has new income earning opportunities of more diversified uh, value chains with new uh, different types of raw materials uh, uh, feeding into um, uh, the manufacturing sector. So it's not just food um, uh, or bioenergy, it's, uh, it's a transformation of raw materials uh, into new, uh, for instance, lignin-based products which uh, revolutionize the housing and construction sector and so on. Let me stop there. Well, thank you very much. So you confirm the importance of the, the connection between the, the ministries. And very much so. Um, and I would add that in Germany, the Environment Ministry, the Development Cooperation Ministry, in addition to the, the leading ministries, uh, the Research and Education and the Agriculture uh, Ministry, have played a significant role. Uh, so forming an interministerial committee has uh, played a significant role, and that is an advice which we can also learn. It doesn't work easily. Ministries like to focus on their silo, but uh, that's where science has played a role to bring them together on an evidence basis. Hello. May Thank I you. ask a question, please? Uh, Professor Jung Yud, oh. yes. Uh, Professor Jung Yud, may, may I uh, let Professor Dr. Christian Lin ask the second question before sure, your question, sure. please? Yes. <laughs> sure. Please, thank, thank you very much. I, I will be very short. Uh, my uh, uh, question is uh, concerning or uh, addressing to pro the president of NASDA, uh, Professor, um, let me see. Siri Lert Vorakul. I have a question because my task is to connect Germany and uh, Thailand. And uh, I believe, since I'm responsible for agriculture, I believe that uh, we can work together in the sector or, or on the strategy, on implementing the strategy of bioeconomy. Do you see any? Uh, possibilities, uh, any fields, any potential where Germany and uh, Thailand may cooperate. Thank you very much for the good question. Uh, before I answer your question, I would like to join uh, uh, a past two 
comment first uh, of the Professor Liu, uh, and also the, the question, the first question is the uh, Dr. Christensen has been uh, asked. I think uh, in Thailand, uh, we practice on the interministerial committee because of the uh, cabinet, Thai cabinet had announced the BCG as the national uh, agenda from this year. The why the Prime Minister Prayut Chan has uh, set up a national committee on BCG and he is the one who chair the committee and asking for NASDA as the secretariat of that committee. This is the first time that a uh, research organization in Thailand been the one who are uh, formulate the policy for the national policy on BCG. In the previous time, we were not the secular people to do the, the national policy. This is one of the things that has been changed in Thailand that we're using STI at the base of the uh, strategy of the country. The second thing is uh, we can uh, co-create and also work cross ministry by using this uh, national committee and the second one, we already set up the Sterling Committee that chaired by the uh, Minister of Higher Education, Science, uh, Research and Innovation that uh, NASDAQ belongs to. And also NASDAQ is the uh, secretary of that uh, Sterling Committee as well. So we, we are the one, the key person that, that can uh, arc the uh, collaboration among the, uh, the ministry in, in Thailand. In order to answer your second question, I will give you some of example. As uh, Professor Brown had mentioned before, that Thailand is one of the partner to join the uh, Global Bow Summit last year, and we are co-host. And also, Professor Molokot is also one of the member of the uh, governing board or the international board of the uh, Global Bow Academy. And also, we work a lot of, uh, we have a lot of projects together with the Lizard Institute in Germany, such as Zurich. We have uh, set up some of the, uh, we call it the, what to call it, the Joy Lizard program, especially on Cassava store project, and also some of the non moving projects and also nano-coating plant, phenopic project. That's some of the projects that we do on uh, research. Apart from that, we're also working closely with GISAT, the international collaboration under the uh, Germany government, uh, working closely with the Thai Environment Institute. And we're going to set up the uh, working group, I think probably next week, in order to working not only in Thailand, we're going to working with Vietnam and also Indonesia and Malaysia on, on that uh, topic as well. These are some of the examples that we can work with Germany and also with the other country as well on the policy uh, uh, formulation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, may I uh, ask Professor yong -Yut? Uh, for his question. Professor Yun Yud is the previously a deputy prime minister of Thailand, uh, minister of science and technology, and previously the president of NASA. Professor Yun Yud, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasit. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all the speakers. I've really learned a lot from this symposium. I have a question for Dr. Hassan Mandal, and maybe for all the other speakers as well, who are involved in supporting uh, good research in their countries. So uh, I note that Turkey has a platform base for support, which is good. I think Thailand is also uh, having that type of uh, uh, a platform base for support as well. My question is, how does a small researcher get support Maybe this researcher, she has a good idea or a good project, but maybe it's small and does not fit well into any of the platforms. So uh, how, how, how do uh, projects like that get support, which I think they should have some support as well. And uh, I, I would like um, other country experiences about this 
a kind of platform versus individual project support. Thank you very much. Professor Hassan, please. I think you're muted. Yeah. You. Sorry, we, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, now we, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Um, so thank you for the question. And um, I mean, I should emphasize that, I mean, not all our funding, of course, with the platforms, but we have been changing starting from 2018 and we put the goal in 2023, which is the 100th years of Turkish Republic. Um, uh, so, I mean, it used to be nearly the 100 percent of the uh, fundings for individuals coming with an idea, and we are funding them. But now we are changing the ecosystem to, uh, I mean, dealing with the with big, big challenges. And uh, I mean, our um, goal is to reaching to 75% of our funding uh, in 2023, for today is only 45%. In uh, uh, so for the big, so the uh, for the funding the big platforms, and the platforms are running for I mean uh, uh, I mean for technology development, for in terms of the um, I mean technology readiness level starting from two three to five six. Uh, and it is coordinating by the universities and collaborating with other university and industry. And if it is from the technology readiness level starting from five, uh, six till eight, nine, and it's a product development and it's running by the companies and collaborating with the universities. And uh, so, and each platform is running initially for four years. And which project is going to be funded is decided by the platforms itself. So in the in the past that I mean, Tubitak headquarters is deciding that all individual projects. So now I mean, um, uh, the, in the platforms that uh, we are looking for, what is the outcome and impact of the platform? And uh, um, and as I said um, for today, uh, about 45 percent of our funding part is going to the platforms, and 55 percent for as you have been mentioned on the individual projects and but this has been moving uh, in terms of the budget wise 75 percent is in 2023 for platform and 25 um, uh, for the for the individual um, uh, projects and it will stay like that so in, in as a result that i mean we will not 100 percent for platform funding and the, the and and our um, reference is coming from the european commission Turkey is in one of the partner, uh, full member partner of Horizon 2020, and now moving to Horizon Europe. So, so this is a kind of also way that what we have been learned during, especially the last, um, I mean, six, seven years, and the kind of a, especially for getting the right outcome and impact. So the the platform type of funding is giving a good opportunity. And finally, so this platform are not static. I mean, so which means that, I mean, we are forming the flat platform with a different type of partners and it, they are not staying for next four years. So one partner can, uh, can, uh, can uh, I mean, remove from the platform and another new university or company can also join the platform while uh, the, the, I mean, the platform program is running. So I, I hope that I mean I may give any kind of an, I mean, experience what we are trying to, and is only, the positive one, uh, only the one that we have been started and ended is during the COVID-19 for the development of the, uh, the, the, the, the vaccine and the drug. And uh, in the, what does it in this platform, for example, they have been using the same infrastructure. They are using the same uh, consumables. I mean, especially during the pandemic is very, very important, the logistics. And also even they are using the same human resources for different projects. So, so the, the, the platforms, uh, not only bringing the projects together, but also changing the working atmosphere from individuals, from collaboration to co-creation. 
And uh, I would like to share this and uh, the experience and, uh, in Taiwan. In, in Taiwan, uh, basically, this and uh, research grants are, are from two sources. One is so-called the bottom-up one. That's a, that's, as you mentioned about, there's a small project for individual. That's a, this kind of a project basically well supported by our Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, it's a button up and this and uh, the grant, the research proposal uh, granted rate is around 50%. So each individual uh, research project can get the support from our uh, Ministry of Science and Technology. And for those uh, related to applied sciences, uh, they can um, apply this uh, individual uh, research project from our Ministry of uh, uh, Health and Welfare for this uh, uh, vaccine for, or new drug or diagnostic uh, researches and so forth. And for the ag agriculture, and they can uh, apply for grants uh, from our Ministry of Agriculture. And also, uh, if this is uh, from the uh, basic research to this uh, product development, and they can also apply for uh, grants from our Ministry of Economic Affairs. And in order to coordinate this kind of uh, research budget and also in integrate it with this uh, so-called uh, top-down uh, research uh, in our cabinet, uh, we have a so-called this uh, biotechnology uh, a coordinating uh, group and uh, try to uh, uh, network and also coordinate that's a uh, basic research and applied research uh, together. That's the situation in Taiwan. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a few questions from the attendee. Uh, the first two one will go to Professor Chen about the pandemic situation. One is on policy level, one is rather technical level. Uh, the, the technical one first, uh, the question is, how is robots, how are robots deployed in Taiwan pandemic situation? And, and the second question is that you suggest about the solidarity uh, against the image infection disease. Uh, what do you see about the international okay. mechanism for that solidarity at this moment? Okay. Um, for this uh, robotic and uh, um, technology, um, basically we use uh, different robots for this environmental uh, disinfection, sanitation, and so forth. That's one thing. And the second thing is we use the uh, robotic and uh, devices to do this uh, patients and uh, uh, so-called daily monitoring of this uh, physio physiological uh, condition. And then we also use this uh, robot for delivery of this uh, uh, garbage or uh, defected uh, objects and so forth. So in Taiwan, uh, we try to use this kind of uh, uh, different kind of uh, automatic uh, robotic uh, devices uh, to taking care of the patient and also to taking care of this uh, uh, resources allocation and so forth. This is one thing. And with regard to this uh, international solidarity uh, for to combat with this um, uh, pandemic, I think that the um, uh, World Health Organization may play a very important role. And in addition to that, there's a uh, regional uh, uh, organization are also very important. For instance, in Asian Pacific region, we have APEC uh, Health Working Group. And I think through this kind of uh, uh, multilateral multinational uh, organization, and we can uh, accelerate this uh, solidarity. But more important thing is that uh, we should have the spirit. This means that uh, we have to help each other, and we have to know that virus respect no border, and we definitely, this kind of sharing of this uh, resources and technology, as well as this uh, PPE and other uh, uh, medical uh, uh, devices, are very important. And recently for the vaccine um, distribution, uh, fortunately we have COVAX and, and supported by CP and so forth. And this kind of uh, uh, coordination is very important for us to supply a vaccine or PPE or, or uh, 
or pharmaceuticals uh, to those uh, the countries who are in need of them. So I, I would like to say that definitely uh, we can uh, work together and to come back with this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that is very clear. Uh, I, I have a similar question uh, addressed to Professor Mindao about the circular economy. Uh, some audience have the feeling that we do not really have international mechanism on, on circular economy. Uh, can you comment something on that, please? Başkan, soru sizlere. Anlamadım ben sorunu. Bu sirküler ekonomi konusunda ne uluslararası bir şeyler yapıyor musunuz şeklinde bir soru geldi. Tamam. Uh, I couldn't get the question. Uh, can you ask one more, please? Sorry. Uh, the question is: It seems that there is no international mechanism to for for the improvement of circular economy at this moment. Uh, I would like to ask your your comments on that that yeah. that situation, yeah, okay. please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I mean, um, I think it's in one of the, um, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the case of the Turkey, again, one more, is a, is, is a uh, full partner of the European programs. And this is the, I mean, um, I mean uh, Horizon Europe, which will start it in 2021 for this year, for the next seven years, is the top topic uh, is, is the, I mean, uh, is a green deal and uh, the economy on the uh, base of the, uh, I mean, green economy. Uh, so in this respect, so this is a kind of a European initiative, but it is covering the, uh, I mean, in a global sense. So, and also Thailand, I know very well, uh, with a good link with the, uh, one of the uh, I mean, special program uh, for the Southeast Asia program of the European Commission and also Turkey is uh, collaborating with Thailand on this respect, not only be, uh, I mean, uh, I, mean uh, be jo uh, I mean, bilaterally and also multinational one. So I think this is uh, the answer for my uh, respect that, I mean, so um, this, in one side, the UN SDGs is increasing the awareness in global sense and also national um, uh, I mean, authorities like Thailand and at least in my country, also in Turkey, but also uh, in regional one in, in Europe is taking this consideration is very top of the agenda. And I think uh, in the next, at least for the uh, 10 years, we will uh, talk more and more on, on, on this topic. Thank, thank you very much for, for the information. I, I have another question on, on bioeconomy. Uh, I understand that the bioeconomy is based mainly on agriculture, and one of the problems of agriculture is the, the fluctuation of the yield or, or the output of agricultural sector. Uh, how do you see that uh, affect the, the, the planning of bioeconomy? Uh, maybe this question go to Professor Wan Brau or, or Professor Kreisit, please. Well, so, join him, you first. Thank you. Agriculture is a volatile sector. You're very correct to mention that. Um, what we have as a problem, uh, I think we need to dissect. Um, we have volatility and we have extreme price volatility and fluctuations. And um, extreme events uh, increase with climate change. Um, so against that background, we need to have uh, investments in um, stabilizing uh, production and markets. Uh, trade is a key uh, factor for stability. Um, but uh, science and technology um, um, uh, resilience against temperature and uh, and uh, humidity shocks um, uh, is uh, key to uh, facilitate a more stable sector. But st instability also is an opportunity for the bioeconomy because if you have um, um, uh, 
excess uh, production can divert raw material uh, uh, flexibly into biomanufacturing. Um, and if uh, the food economy is uh, short and with high prices, you need to reduce that buffer opportunity in order to uh, facilitate a food first uh, and food sector protection. So uh, it requires an intelligent dealing with the instability issues. Um, and I'm grateful that you mentioned uh, that issue. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Professor Gracie, would you like to add something on this? Well, I, I have very little to add. That's why I think we have to uh, emphasize a lot of basic, uh, basic uh, practice in agriculture and food system so that it will be more or less uh, more stable. Obviously, nowadays, it's very difficult to predict the yield because of climate change. And at the same time, also, the price have been very fluctuated, uh, particularly uh, international competition. However, I still think that we have to emphasize on uh, the, the, the, the farmer and farming, a group of farmer, and also knowledge base. And then uh, start with the basic, so that we can predict, at least forecast, what will happen. And then I also agree with Joe him that uh, we have to think carefully about uh, demand and supply so that we can manage at national level through the policy, and then we can manage at a local area to planning. So, so just to, to, to have a short answer for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> Professor Malakot, please. Yeah. Professor uh, Malakot, Just to continue room. with uh, this uh, question, May I ask Dr. Kaisit and Professor Cho Kim, you know, probably you can probably give uh, advice or something like that. Right now, we talk about the healthy diets. So it means that, you know, people, they say the population eat, now they eat more, you know, like more starch than, you know, vegetable and fruit. So if you talk about the uh, supply, matching between supply and demand, how are you going to convince like farmers in Thailand? Mostly, you know, I think they, about 60% of our land, agricultural land, grow rice, you know, and less for vegetable and, and, and fruit. If you're going to, con you think you can convince the farmers to change the pattern, you know, like from rice to, you know, fruit and vegetable? May, may I try to answer first? I think this is a, a very good question and also difficult to answer. Uh, globally, there is a, a, a trend to promote the demand for healthy diet, promote promotion of demand for healthy diet. There are many, many international uh, uh, recommendations. So not only carry, not only simple uh, quality, but it's a combination of uh, various food groups so that people will receive a high quality energy source from um, carbohydrate, protein, and uh, fat with high quality protein and also high quality fat. And at the same time, reduce sugar consumption, particularly purify uh, sugar. Then eat a lot of uh, fruit and vegetable. And also, uh, uh, fish. So the demand are there. Uh, of course, with regard to dairy product, uh, for uh, yogurt product have been very popular nowadays. So all in all, we have to promote like a balance uh, and uh, diet with a great variety of uh, food product. So promotion can be done, and people have been aware. Uh, and and of, of course, again, I should like to mention that it, uh, we have to emphasize on uh, capacity building to smart farmers, smart farming. And then, uh, of course, support uh, using uh, science technology instead of supporting the subsidy. Thailand has uh, used a lot of money for uh, subsidize the price of uh, farmer, and uh, instead of uh, building capacity 
of farmer and farming, and then uh, learning by doing, linking uh, with a local university. So that is a good trend. Uh. So, so uh, I try to, to answer what we can do nowadays. Thank you. You think Professor Cho Kim? <laughs> Still well, more harder. <laughs> farmer, farmers are convinced by prices and by income. And um, if we uh, uh, don't facilitate um, um, that uh, fruits and vegetables are very competitive uh, with uh, uh, rice and other cereals, um, they will not switch. We have a problem. Um, uh, fruits and vegetables um, in uh, many countries, I don't know about Thailand, but I know about um, India, for instance, um, have been um, uh, rather expensive compared to uh, calorie-dense um, foods, say rice and wheat and maize. Why have um, the, the cereals become relatively cheaper uh, in the last uh, two or three decades? Because we have heavily invested in science and technology to make them um, more competitive, and that has driven down prices, and that is good for peer, poor people, but the balance is lost. And that's why the, the macro incentive structure for healthy diet is distorted. So um, we need to invest in um, the technological advances to make fruits and vegetables more competitive. Uh, uh, government and private sector need to partner to facilitate uh, market access, cold chains, uh, uh, processing, uh, processing for healthy um, uh, fruits and vegetables, and uh, in addition to uh, the promotion and the um, education and extension, which have been mentioned by my colleague already. Thank you very much. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, by uh, because we are on this issue, may, may also ask another point that is the, currently we are having the plant-based meat. And we will probably have the insect-based meat. What do you see uh, the role of this, this kind of food in, in, in, in the bioeconomy in, in the near future? I think the main opportunity is not with food, but with feed, uh, animal feed, insect-based animal feed. Um, and that's progressing well. Uh, good programs in East Africa, for instance, uh, startup uh, initiatives in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, so uh, um, this uh, insect-based uh, uh, feed for poultry, etc., uh, is an opportunity. May, may I may I provide additional um, elaboration? Uh, in many countries, like in Southeast Asia, including Thailand, and also in many countries in Africa, insects have been considered as unconventional source of protein. So it's for human being, and of course, one can eat eat a cook or fry uh, insect directly. And also now they, they try to make uh, insect powder for human consum consumption and mix with uh, with flour to produce other food items. And uh, so I think uh, we, we can use for human consumption, but it has to fit well with uh, their eating habit. Uh, and also can be used as an animal feed uh, component. With regard to... Uh, Plant protein. I think uh, this is a new trend also because uh, people eat red meat, particularly uh, red meat. So they are looking for product from uh, bean, uh, particularly soybean. And it has been a traditional uh, eating habit in this area, uh, in Taiwan, China, in Southeast Asia. So one can promote this. So all in all, the whole thing including uh, uh, let meat um, eat more uh, soy-based product, uh, more fruit, vegetable. It's called uh, responsible consumption. So that uh, carbon footprint 
in terms of greenhouse gas and also water footprint will be neutralized. So, and also they are, are, are also healthier, but it will take time to, to change people eating behavior. Thank you. Okay. This is what you call cultural diversity. <laughs> usually, you know, you know cricket. I, I, I, I usually show this slide, you know, when I talk about, you know, like uh, biodiversity. You know, cricket in U.S., they call pest. In China, they call pets, P-E-T. And in Thailand, we call appetizer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that, that. In, in Thailand, we, we are quite familiar with, with insect <laughs> food. And, and uh, we are willing to, to serve you sometimes if you have a chance to come to Thailand. <laughs> I'm not kidding. With a healthy diet, you have to be cultural accepted as well, right? Yeah. Uh, we, I, I have the one, one, another question, uh, which is more scientific, uh, probably addressed to Professor Leo. Uh, we, we have a several projects on, on carbon dioxide capture. How do you think uh, the carbon dioxide capture things fit to this BCG uh, economy? So, sorry, I cannot hear you. Okay. okay. I think carbon dioxide capture is a necessity in the future. It's very, very important. Although the current technologies are still the quite expensive, but I see that as the key component for the whole world to reach a net zero by year 2050. And so, uh, although currently it's uh, still the far away to use carbon dioxide to produce uh, uh, chemicals, materials, or energy, but this is the way that I think it has to go. And that couples very well with the bioeconomy. So, Initially, we use uh, plants via uh, agriculture to take advantage of photosynthesis to capture CO2. And then we process the plant materials to chemicals and materials or even energy. In the future, we'll have to learn how to increase the efficiency of this process and maybe using chemical mimic mimicry instead of using the whole plant to fix CO2. And that includes many things that people have talked about um, uh, in recent years, uh, including using microorganisms, using enzymes, using uh, various uh, new catalysts to directly harvest CO2 first from full gas and then eventually from air. Uh, so I see this will be a necessary uh, way to go uh, in the long run. But when I say long run, that means 30 years, because we need to achieve all these by 2050. Thank you very much for, for, for your point. I, and I speaking have... of that, uh, yes. can I follow up with uh, a question uh, to all the participants? If we want to develop uh, uh, bioeconomy or eventually carbon dioxide capture, we will need to consider carbon price or carbon tax. i like to get the feedback from various uh, countries. Uh, how do your countries see the feasibility of uh, carbon tax or carbon price? Uh, Mr. I'm not sure uh, who would like to address this. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm Suwit. Oh, yes, please, Dr. Zuit. Yes, uh, now Thailand, uh, I think, have a voluntary approach. They can uh, sell uh, the carbon each other between the company or factory and uh, <clears throat> the tech uh, incentive is that you can exempt uh, the uh, income tax from uh, that uh, selling. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, the policy of uh, our governments. Because uh, 
at this moment, the what we call the price of uh, CO2 is, is quite low because we based on the international uh, uh, price. So it now just, I think, uh, not, it's below $1 per ton. <laughs> But, but uh, like uh, the ethanol uh, factory, bioethanol factory can sell a lot to uh, cement industry or something. Because uh, our, I mean, export uh, good should meet the standard, like uh, EU standard or uh, Japan or Korea standard for the emission. So they, they trade together. So that's my, my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Mandel, uh, can you share some, uh, can you share something about the carbon? Yeah, uh, yeah I, mean, uh, I, I mean, I can almost say that I'm, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can only say that it is uh, still in a policy level. I mean, for year, um, I mean, in one side is, yes, year 2050 is zero emission. Uh, but also there is a much more nearer, I mean, nearest time on 2030 uh, agenda as well. So, I mean, um, and Turkey now is, I mean, uh, is also working on very much on uh, cement um, and uh, uh, ceramic um, and uh, steel industry, and so these are the highest um, uh, potentials uh, for, um, uh, for for the uh, for um, the carbon emission side. So I mean, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I can only transparently say that I mean, a policy level, yes, uh, for 2030 there is a cer certain goals and uh, initiatives, and but still um, in early stage, and we, I mean, as um, I mean, my agency is Tubitak. Uh, we have been put most of our agenda. I mean, uh, uh, on on on the carbon capturing on and also uh, reaching to the 2030 goals. Um, so I mean, uh, so this is my answer. Thank you very much for, for sharing this. Uh, I'm not sure whether we we have some information in Germany at this moment. Uh, carbon price is uh, uh, considered as uh, a key policy instrument in the European Union and in Germany. Um, uh, carbon price has for quite some time been rather low, about uh, uh, 20 euros a ton. Uh, but um, there are plans to uh, use the instrument uh, much more in the future. Um, it, uh, carbon needs to be priced at its shadow price, at its shadow cost. So, um, <clears throat> meaning um, the damage every ton does uh, in the long term, um, uh, which is calculated more at the level between 60 and 120 euros a ton, uh, will probably in the long term be the price which we have to pay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we do not hear from Taiwan yet. <laughs> okay, well, um, <laughs> for this and uh, carbon price and carbon tax uh, is still, uh, it's been uh, discussed in uh, our Congress. So not um, finalized yet, but um, uh, you know that um, we know that um, the goal of 2050 to have uh, zero carbon. So what the, uh, we are doing now is for this and uh, green energy, and we hope that by 2025, 20% of the energy uh, electricity is well from the solar energy and also offshore wind energy. And our industry of offshore wind energy is, is booming uh, quite well, but uh, for the carbon tax and carbon price, we still uh, under the discussion, we have not made any kind of uh, uh, mandatory uh, uh, statement for that. I guess that we have 
time for the last question. This is for for anyone that who would like to to to answer. Uh, the concern is how do how are we going to to uh, communicate the idea that we are talking today to the next generation of people so that they understand the importance of what we are talking about. Do you see this is a problem or, or actually it is quite well known among, among the young already? Uh, in Taiwan, basically the young people here, they are really concerned about the climate change, global warming, and they are concerned about the food security and also uh, bioeconomy. They are much more concerned than the elderly and, and the adults in in, uh, in Taiwan. So I think that they do have this uh, mindset and how to uh, create a, a better uh, world in the future. But I think that uh, we have to uh, work together and host the public and private through the public and private partnership in order to engage in a, a better world uh, and through this uh, very uh, if, efficient and effective uh, biocircular and uh, green economy policies. So that's, that's the situation in Taiwan. Young people always have uh, more dream about the future than this uh, the adults. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there anybody who would like to, to comment about the situation of young Professor Mendel, would you like to share something about yes. that? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe a contribution as well uh, in the same respect. So, I mean, till COVID-19, maybe, I mean, we have been considering the type of um, uh, collaboration or co-creation co in, in, in a, between the uh, university, academics, industry, and the government. And COVID-19 has been, I mean, at least from our experience in Turkey, it has been engaging more with the society because especially when we are talking about the COVID-19, that uh, there is a more, um, I mean, uh, I mean, effect on the society, I mean, rather than the economy, uh, what is the effect on the society in sociologically, psychologically. So, uh, so, so when we are dealing with the type of, this type of challenges, and also, I mean, uh, reflecting to the, um, I mean, uh, uh, green economy, by a circular green economy. So in the same respect, so the more involvement of the society in the, this type of topics and challenges will uh, create a better um, uh, outcome and impact. And uh, when we are considering the society, so the young generation uh, is, is the top priority. So this is the, my uh, contribution. Thank, thank you very much. We, we, we start uh, with COVID-19. We probably need to finish the last question. We have a couple of minutes, probably. Uh, do, how do you see the BCG principle uh, can be used to, to prevent the next pandemic, if it is possible? Uh, I'm not sure. Professor Shen, can you share? <laughs> yes. I, I think that uh, the principle is that um, COVID-19 indeed accelerates this, uh, the progress in our uh, biotechnology, in this uh, invention of vaccine, antivirus, and diagnostic. Um, I think that uh, this is a good sign from the science. Uh, we can accelerate our uh, biotechnology uh, for this and uh, generate a good uh, uh, antiviral vaccine and diagnostic for the future pandemic. But more importantly, I will consider that um, there's a uh, transparency and there's a uh, reporting of any uh, epidemic. When there's only a couple of cases, this kind, of, this country or endemic area has to, to be helped by the World Health Organization and the other countries to put off the fire at the very beginning. For this instance, say COVID-19, if we can help China to contain this uh, COVID-19 outbreak in December 2019, it will not spread out. So that's a good reporting system and help uh, this kind of country to contain the outbreak 
is definitely very important. Keep good surveillance on it. I think that Ebola is a very good example. So for Ebola, it always contains in some African country because they reported uh, rapidly and transparently and all the nations went there to help the containment of the Ebola. So I think that in the future, uh, we need a very good reporting system, surveillance system, and have a good system to uh, invent uh, vaccine and uh, diagnostic as soon as possible through this kind of effort. And this means there's a science and technology as well as there's a solidarity to help each other. We can contain the future pandemic. So, thank, thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we, we have probably used up the time and I would like to thank all the uh, keynote speaker, all the participants and all the panelists for, for, for, for the really fruitful discussion. I learned a lot from the discussion. Thank you very much again. And I would like to pass it back to the uh, moderator, Professor Lily, please. Thank you, Professor Pasit. It has been a great discussion. So again, thank you all speakers, panelists and audiences who actively participate in this discussion. Now I would like to invite Dr. Nerong to give us a closing remark. I think it is a, a very good time that this session can bring all together all good friends to meet in online. Anyway, we are now come to the course of this session. I would like to begin with my expressing my sincere appreciation to all the keynote speakers, presidents, and leaders of scientific and academic institutes from Thailand and overseas for attending this important forum and for your stimulating presentations and discussion. Today's forum has shed some light on how research and innovation can support BCG and sustainability in the world post-pandemic and provide opportunity for collaboration among institutions to advance the process of research, translation, and commercialization. According to my note, please allow me to briefly share with you some key messages coming out of this forum. Firstly, the need of strong commitment to sustainable development at all levels was emphasized. Strategies and conditions in each nation may differ, but we are have a common goal which is Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which we believe is a core strategy to restore our economies and society from the pandemic's impact. Changes in government, business, and individual behavior on a massive scale are required. Secondly, the important role of human resources was less it has been established that STI has enormous potential to improve the economies and society and maintain the balance of eco ecosystem. However, the power of STI cannot be unleashed without the support of the light human capabilities, skill, and talent. Therefore, Building a knowledge-based society and prepare people to be more resilient to change is also important. Thirdly, we need to enhance knowledge sharing of BCG across the nations to support networking of people, authorities, and stakeholders that is responsive to the dynamism of these issues. More partnerships should be fought among public and private organizations to promote sustainable development. Firstly, harmony is the key. Fundamental concept of the BCG economy models is to strengthen capacity, starting from local communities, expanding to the nation level, and connecting to the world by being part of the global supply chain collaborating with international partners to co-create knowledge and innovations and engaging and playing an active role in international 
initiatives to advance sustainability agenda. Therefore, close collaborations among the government, industry, local communities, academia, and international organizations are necessary to drive this sustainability agenda to the success. In response to the BCG policy and global pandemic, NASDA is committed to supporting and learning from our partners in both science and networking across the world. The development of innovative solutions for global sustainable development and moving forward with bio, circular, green economy through the post-pandemic together. Once again, thank you very much for your support and participation. We, NASDAQ, look forward to our fruitful cooperation in years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Narong. Now we come to the end of the session. I hope you all enjoyed the President's Forum 2021. Hope to see you all again next year. Until then, please stay safe. And thank you very much again. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>